Hello students, this is Professor Ryan Singh Paul, and this is the video lecture on Hesiod and his two works, uh, two major works that we'll be reading in this course, The Theogony and The Works and Days. So first, who was Hesiod? Um, he's our earliest source of Greek religion and culture that still exists, that there's still copies of um, in existence. And he was probably roughly contemporaneous with Homer, who wrote the Iliad and the Odyssey, uh, perhaps earlier. Not entirely sure, but probably roughly contemporaneous with Homer. And the scholarly consensus is that he was a real person. There was a real Hesiod. This isn't just a name that was made up. Um, but at the same time, the works that we have that exist, the Theogony, the Works and Days, and, and a few others, uh, they almost definitely contain additions from later writers, things that were added that represent um, later cultural ideas or things that occurred after Hesiod's lifetime. So a little bit in, a little bit of information on Hesiod's life. He lived sometime in the late 8th to mid 17th century BCE. That just means before common era. It's the same as BC. So remember, of course, when we're talking about BC or BCE, the numbers go backwards. So he lived from around 850 uh, or 8, uh, 820 to 750. Um, we get some autobiographical information from him from his poetry. He tells us that he's the son of an immigrant to the Greek peninsula. His father immigrated there from elsewhere. And he was a shepherd in his life. That's what his trade was. And he lived on or near Mount Helicon. Um, and that is where, as he says in his poetry, he was visited by the muses, the uh, divine beings that uh, Greeks believe to inspire all music and art and, and stories. And they visited him while he was working as a shepherd and they inspired him to become a poet. We also know that he was successful as a poet. Um, he tells us about how he traveled to the city of Euboea and won a poetic contest in the city in honor of their ruler, Amphidamus. So he was a successful poet as well. And we know he had a brother named Perses. Uh, and in the works and days, he chastises his brother for his lack of ambition and for his bad behavior, says his brother was trying to get money out of him that he didn't deserve. So this is a little bit of what Hesiod tells us about his life. There are two major works of Hesiod that we'll be reading in this class. The first is the Theogony, which really just means the creation of the gods or the birth of the gods. And, and that's what he does. He talks about the birth of the gods and the emergence of the cosmos, of the universe, and how it moved from a state of initial chaos to order. And that's one of the main themes, as we'll see. His other major work is The Works and Days. And this is a much less interesting poem than the Theogony, but still important. And it's closer, it's more of a mythical history of humanity, of humankind, uh, but also a very didactic poem. That means a, a poem intended to teach, and that's one of the reasons why it's not quite as interesting, about the proper ways of life, about the way that we should live life. And there are other works that he wrote, or, or that are attributed to him, I should say, um, that exist, although many of them now we think he didn't really write. Uh, it's important to note, though, that Hesiod did not invent the stories he tells. He is not at the beginning of a tradition. Rather, he seems to be closer to the later period or the end of a tradition. So what he writes, these are a synthesis, a combination of long-established pre-existing stories that people would have been familiar with. What's important is the way he puts them together. Hesiod was a poet. Uh, so just a little bit about Greek poetry, it's important to know that Greek poetry emerged out of songs and out of song contests. It emerged out of an oral tradition. And these were contests in which different poets competed to praise the gods. And these poems were usually spontaneous. They were improvised on the spot. That doesn't mean they made everything up just completely out of nothing. Rather, they had all sorts of familiar and formulaic phrases and stories, titles, and then they improvised those or put them together in different ways with newly created elements to create these impressive poems as part of their contest. And as I said in a previous lecture, there is a religious subject matter. They're talking about um, the gods, for example, but these were not religious or sacred texts in the same way that the Bible, for example, is a sacred text to Christians. So they talk about the gods, but these weren't religious texts 
So given that Greek poetry emerged from song and was entirely spoken, not written down, the question that scholars ask is, did Hesiod write these poems down himself or were they written down later? Um, what we know is that he clearly emerged from a tradition of oral literature. There's all sorts of aspects of the poem that scholars who study this say reveal that this was originally oral poetry. Um, so there's various stylistic things and techniques, et cetera, that are, that are characteristic of oral poetry, oral traditions. Um, at the same time, the written alphabet was introduced to Greece around the time of Hesiod's lifetime. So he might have been familiar with the written alphabet. And the general theory now is that he may have used the alphabet. We're not sure. He either may have used it himself or had someone else write down parts of his poetry in order to record it. Um, however, the extant versions, those that we actually have, um, are definitely from much later periods, and they have all sorts of ideas from these later periods. Other authors wrote down Hesiod's stories, but they added to it and removed things from it in order to suit the changing tastes and changing ideas. Um, and this may seem strange to us, why wouldn't they put their own name? Um, but there was a very different understanding of literature and authorship. So it's actually you were doing yourself a favor by putting your work and, and attributing Hesiod's name to it, that made it much more likely to be read or heard and preserved because of the authority associated with his name. So in Hesiod's works, he talks about the gods. So let's talk about Greek religion for a second. Um, Greek religion was polytheistic. That is, rather than monotheism like Christianity or Islam or Judaism, they believed in multiple divine or supernatural beings. Um, and it's also syncretic. That means they combined relig religious traditions from many different sources, from all, all the different cultures that they came in contact with. And that's why there are multiple beings associated with the same objects or, or ideas. So for example, both Artemis and Selene, two different beings, are both associated with the moon. And there's another, uh, there's uh, many other examples of this. And that's also why we have uh, all the different conflicts and competitions between the different gods over rulership that perhaps represents the historical conflict between different cultures as they came together. Greek religion was also anthropomorphic. That means human shaped. Uh, that is the gods are recognizably human in the way they're described and in their behavior. These are not um, like the, uh, uh, the god of Christianity or Islam that is above humanity, is very different from humanity. These gods are definitely human-like. And finally, the gods inhabit the cosmos that we live in. They're not separate from or outside of it. So this is very different from modern Judaism or Christianity or Islam, where the divine being is outside of our reality. It transcends our reality. So these gods are very much a part of the reality of the human world. As I said, Greek religion was syncretic. It combined uh, stories from many different cultures. So where did they come from? Well, um, many of them came from the ancient Near East. Uh, Babylon, Egypt, these areas, what's the sort of modern Middle Eastern area. Uh, many of the stories and, and, and gods and beliefs came from that area. They also came from Indo-European migrants, um, and that's where, for example, Zeus, the, story, the myth of Zeus came from. So that's a god that was imported from another culture and then came to be the dominant belief in Greek religion. Because of its syncretic nature, Greek religion um, was populated by all sorts of different types of gods and other beings. So we have the god Zeus and his pantheon, um, again, imported through Indo-European migrants. And these were the main objects of worship for Greek religion, um, both during Hesiod and Homer's time, as well as in the later eras where, as I've discussed in my What is Myth lecture, uh, belief became more complex and not quite so literal. And it seems that different cities 
uh, were devoted to different gods, and they might have focused on the worship of Poseidon or Athena or Artemis over one other god. And there were also different cults devoted to different gods. So it wasn't like everyone just worshipped Zeus and didn't care about any of the others. They, they looked at all sorts of different beings, depending on what they needed or what um, their culture was. There were also these mythical beings like the Titans that represent older orders, and perhaps these were uh, belief systems that were in place before the Indo-European migrants. Um, and in the stories we have of Zeus overthrowing the Titans, that might be a representation of the overthrow of past religions. There are, of course, various animalistic and monstrous creatures that we'll see, um, and lots of person personified elements of nature and subdivinities. So we have the sun and the moon, who are actual beings as well as physical objects, and then there are beings like river nymphs, these spirits that embody or occupy um, the elements of the world around us. And finally, there are personified forces and concepts, like sleep and death, these things that aren't really physical but that we experience in the world around us, and they were made into personified characters in the myth. So when we look at Greek myths, we see a number of layers of history that have been compressed into one sort of flat text, but we can unfold it and peel these layers away. Again, Hesiod is not the inventor of his stories. He's collecting together numbers of tales that have been circulating through his culture for decades and perhaps centuries, and he's putting them all together, trying to make sense of them into one coherent narrative. And of course, these, again, are incorporated and appropriated from all sorts of different cultures, and they might even represent the conflicts between the cultures. As we'll see in the Theogony, Hesiod talks about these different pantheons, these different rulers, of the universe that are then overthrown by the following generation. And perhaps that represents, historically, the conflict as one culture came in and became dominant over another. And from what we can tell, there was no central authority. Um, the way, for example, there's the Catholic Church and the Pope in Rome. There's no central authority that established an official version. Um, rather, every city, every locale developed its own practices and traditions based on this complex mix of different stories. So there's a lot of variety and diversity in Greek myth and, and religion, even though we only have a few select stories that still remain. Now let's talk about the main themes that we see in Hesiod's work. One of the most important themes for Hesiod is order. He's very much focused on um, promoting and maintaining order against chaos. Uh, so he talks about in the Theogony, as well as in the works and days, how order arose from a primal chaos. And it's through the power of these deities, like Zeus, that order is established. And he also talks about how this order is maintained despite conflict. How is it that despite all the changes and conflicts that we see every day in the world around us, that things don't fall apart? That's another one of Hesiod's thing, uh, uh, themes. And this is all part of his style and his overall purpose, which is, again, to make a comprehensible text out of this vast, complex system of different tales and beliefs. Another important aspect of Hesiod's work is its didacticism and his focus on propriety. So he's really intending to teach people, um, teach his audience, what are the proper ways to live? How should we behave? What do the gods want of us? What are our moral and religious duties? And we see this uh, most explicitly in the way in Works and Days, he chastises his brother Perses for being um, a ne'er-do-well, for being a, a, a lazy person who tries to get money that he doesn't deserve. So there's a great deal of teaching intended in Hesiod's works. So let's look first specifically at the theogony, which again just means the creation or the birth of the gods. The major ideas in theogony, there's that idea of creation. How did the world come into being? How did the universe come into being? Uh, again, the theme of 
chaos to order, and that is the great conflict that sort of defines the universe in Hesiod's view. Um, and he divides the universal forces into masculine and feminine powers. And one of the ways that order is established is through the subjugation of feminine to masculine power. And of course, he's talking about these through these great mythical beings that you know, he may or may not have literally believed in. But of course, as we might guess, this idea of masculine taking power and authority over feminine in order to establish order, that will of course have many profound social implications as well for the ways that real men and women interact. And when you read the Theogony, it's important to be aware of Hesiod's stylistic techniques. What is he, how does he write? One thing is that he uses epithets, um, that is titles or descriptive um, phrases. So there's all these formulaic descriptions that highlight some feature of the being or the places described. So he talks about Aegis bearing Zeus, and an Aegis is a, is a shield. So Zeus, that tells us that Zeus protects, and he's also mighty because he is a warrior, or lovely-haired Rhea, or the wine-dark sea. So these are those formula that, again, are very characteristic of oral literature. They're, they're little phrases that, we, that the poets would use to remember, and they immediately given their audience a picture of this character and give us an understanding of who they are. There's also a, a lot of epic catalogs. So we have these long lists of gods and places. Um, and this is really, again, it's about the oral nature of this poetry, its oral origins. Um, it's a very impressive feat of memory for a poet singer to just rattle off a list of 10, 15, 20, 30 different gods and their um, lineage. Uh, at the beginning of the poem, we see the traditional invocation of the muses, the idea that the muses are the divine source of inspiration. So he begins, as does Homer, as does Ovid, as does pretty much every ancient poet, with an invocation, asking the muses to help him speak. And finally, and this is what makes the poem a little confusing if we're not familiar with the stories, is that it's non-chronological. He doesn't start at the beginning and go straight through to the end. Rather, his narrative jumps about in time. Um, so be aware of that as you're reading it because he'll talk about in one portion be beings or figures that don't exist until much later in his history, but he jumps around. And what that seems to reflect is that his audience already knew many of these stories. They knew these figures. Again, what's unique about Hesiod is the way he combines them into one coherent text. So let me break down the narrative of the Theogony for you so you have a sense of how it proceeds. And the line numbers here are going to refer to the translation that I'm using. Um, so they may be different if you're using a different translation, but the major sections still hold true. The introduction, it begins with the invocation of the muses and the introduction of Hesiod himself, the poet singer. And this is, again, very traditional to call upon the muses to inspire because a human being, a mere human, a mere shepherd, of course, could not have the intellect, could not have the um, knowledge to tell of these fantastical, mythical stories. Then he moves into the first generation of gods and divine beings um, and the creation and birth of the titans that just sort of come out of um, uh, the, the primal forces. And we see the first revolt as Kronos, uh, the uh, king of the Titans, kills, uh, revolts against his father and uh, in order to take over. And this leads to the birth of Aphrodite, the goddess of love. Then we have a long section where he talks about a lot of other early divinities. And in here we see him again jumping around and narratively because he mentions some later human heroes like Perseus and Heracles, even though, of course, they're not born at this point temporally in the narrative, he refers to them and some of their later deeds. Then we get into a description of the river Styx, which is in Hades in the underworld, and the story of Zeus and making his oaths to his fellow gods. Um, and again, we haven't in the in the main narrative itself, Zeus hasn't even been born yet, but here again we see Hesiod jumping around a little bit 
and talking about how Zeus made this, these oaths to support and, and share power with his fellow gods. Uh, then we have a hymn to the goddess uh, Hecate, or Hecate, I'm not quite sure how it's pr pr pronounced, um, but a very famous hymn to this goddess. Um, and then we get the story of Zeus and his pantheon, how his gods, uh, his, his fellow uh, gods were born um, from Kronos, and how Zeus, much like his father Kronos, revolted against his father and took over rule. So we have a second revolt, a second overturning of the previous pantheon of powers that ruled the cosmos. And then we get a long story of Prometheus, and Hesiod will repeat this story, a slightly different form, in the works and days. Uh, he tells us how Prometheus tricked Zeus, even though Zeus also seems to be aware of the trickery, and how Prometheus was then punished for this trickery. And the punishment uh, for humanity, because humans benefit from Prometheus' trickery, is that we now have women. Uh, women are created as the punishment for humanity. Now, of course, this raises the question, if there were no women before, how did humans reproduce? Hesiod doesn't bother to answer that. Um, but perhaps more importantly, this shows us that there is a sort of fundamental misogyny in Hesiod's poetry. That, again, this idea of the masculine being um, dominant over the feminine extends to his attitude towards human women, that human women cause problems, are a burden for humankind. Now, moving on in the narrative, we get the Titanomachy, or the war against the Titans. Zeus um, frees the Cyclops, or the Cyclops. Um, these were an earlier generation contemporaneous with the Titans, but they had been enslaved. Zeus frees them, and in return, they give him powers. They give him the, the Thunderbolt. Um, and the Titans, the previous rulers, the generation before Zeus, they attack Zeus. They want to take control. So Zeus and his Olympians, with the help of the Cyclops, fight against the Titans and finally defeat them. And because they are defeat, defeated, they are banished to Tartaros, uh, which is in the underworld. And then we have a description of the underworld wherein the Titans have been banished. Then, quite interestingly, we get the story of Typhoeus, or Typhius. Um, again, not quite sure how to pronounce it. And Typhius is prophesized to overthrow Zeus in the way that Zeus overthrew Cronus, in the way Cronus overthrew his father. But Zeus, interestingly enough, managed to, manages to defeat this monster and maintain his rule. So even though it's prophesied that Zeus will be overthrown, Zeus defeats him and maintains his rule. Finally, in the last lines of the poem, we get the many children of Zeus, his divine and semi-divine and human offspring, a long list of them and some of their deeds, and then a list of the offspring of some of the other Olympians. And that's the basically the, the ending of the Theogony. There are a final couple lines that begin the introduction to a poem called The Catalog of Women, which is a collection of stories about famous women that's ascribed to Hesiod, but perhaps not written by him. Given his earlier uh, discussion of women as punishment, um, it seems odd that he would write a story about famous women, but perhaps he did, perhaps he didn't. So that's the end of the Theogony. So here are some questions to think about as you're reading and after you've read the Theogony. First, some general questions. First, who are the most important and noteworthy characters? Who seems to be most important to Hesiod's story? And how are they described? What are the terms, the epithets, the formulae that are used to describe these characters and which are most memorable? In looking at these characters and what they do, and how they behave and the way they're described, what are the ideas or values that are associated with them? Sometimes these are spelled out, but what are the other sorts of ideas that are implied about these characters? And what are the moral or ethical judgments that Hesiod makes or encourages uh, us to make about these characters? That is, what defines goodness and, or badness when we look at these different divinities? What are some of the narrative patterns that we see 
recurring through the poem. One very obvious one is that of revolution, of revolution of one generation against the other. So what sort of repetitions do we see? Also, are there contrasts? Are there uh, patterns that are opposed to each other or moments when these patterns are broken? And why? What does that mean? What are the values that might be expressed in these patterns? Why do they recur? What does it say about how Hesiod understands the way the universe works and the principles that govern the universe? Remember that order is very important to Hesiod. So how is order created in this poem? And what threatens order? And do we see any uh, perhaps contradictions? Uh, is order sometimes threatened by the very forces that created it? And how is order related to power and to violence. In what ways do power or violence affect order either positively by creating it or negatively by disrupting it? Looking at a few more specific things, uh, and these are just a few questions, there are many that we could ask. How does he describe the muses? And how does he describe his own interaction with them? How did they inspire him? What happened? And what was his status relative to the muses? And what does this tell us about how Hesiod and Greek culture understood the nature of creativity and where creative ideas, where poetry, where art comes from? How does his interactions with the muses represent their notion of artistic invention and creativity? Look at the different couplings, the different uh, sexual interactions and the various births, some of which occur spontaneously, some of which occur after impregnation. Uh, Chaos and Gaia, for example, birth various divinities without any sort of sexual intercourse. Uh, but Gaia also then mates with her son, Uranos, and has children. Kronos mates with his sister, the various other matings and offspring. What do these genealogies suggest about how the ancient Greeks understood the nature of the universe? That is, if the gods represent or embody certain forces, Erebos is darkness, Nyx is night, how do their couplings and offspring express the way the Greeks thought the universe worked? That is, are there certain philosophical or we might call them proto-scientific, pseudo-scientific understandings of where things come from, why the universe is the way it is? So think about the genealogies and these interactions. And then one question, a question that I don't really have an answer to, but I encourage you to think about, why is there so much incest among the divinities? Why are children mating with their offspring or their siblings? And what is going on with that? What might that suggest psychologically, historically, morally, ethically about the way the Greeks understood divinity and the nature of the universe? Another narrative pattern to think about, the various revolts amongst the god. Kronos revolts against his father, Uranos. Zeus revolts against his father, Kronos. But then Zeus uh, foils two potential revolts, that of Typhius and that of an un his unborn son by his first wife, Metis. Um, so what historical or cultural events or conflicts might these stories express? What ideas might they express about the Greek past? And how is Zeus's rulership, how is his kingdom different from that of his predecessors? Which leads finally to this question, why is Zeus able to maintain his kingship while his predecessors were overthrown? Is there something about Zeus himself, about the nature of his rule that allows him to maintain it? How is he different from what came before? Now let's talk about The Works and Days, which is admittedly a much less interesting and fun poem to read than The Theogony. Although in some ways it's a little bit more straightforward in its narrative structure, it's not quite as, as interesting. This, it's mostly uh, a didactic poem. That is, it's meant to instruct in morals and behavior. And it's directed at the common man, the farmer, the worker, the everyday person. So this is about human affairs far more than it is about divine affairs, one of the things that differentiates it from the theogony. And it's a mix of moral and ethical advice as well as practical advice, although I put practical in quotes, as we'll see when we look at the poem itself, because it's not entirely practical. One thing we note about the style and the framing of Works and Days is that repeatedly 
Hesiod addresses himself to Perses, his dissolute, wayward brother. Um, and the story that he tells is that Perseus attempted to take more than his fair share of their father's inheritance by bribing the local rulers through trickery and guile. So Hesiod admonishes him for his lack of discipline, for his laziness and cheating nature, and tries to instruct him in virtue. Repeatedly, he comes back and says, Perses, listen to this. This is something that you need to know. However, that is not to say that this is a poem directed just to Perses. Through Perses, Hesiod addresses all those who wish to know right from wrong. What are the themes of works and days. One of the most important themes that we see at the beginning is that of the decline of man, the decline of humanity. He goes through various ages of man and he says that this present era, the one in which he lives, is the most degraded. Humanity has lost its greatness, it's lost much of its virtue, and as a result we must suffer and toil. Labor is what the modern man, that is Hesiod's modern man, must uh, endure. And there's no hope, there's no sense that there's any hope for a return to the earlier glories. The past ages, the heroes of the past, the great beings of the past are dead and gone, and our lot is only going to be suffering and toil, with no possibility of escape until death. The two cardinal virtues that Hesiod champions in Works and Days are justice and work. Uh, he says that justice is the basis of any possibility of peace and prosperity. Prosperity Without justice, there can be no peace. There can be no prosperous uh, life for humans. And his attempt here is not just to say this is, a, this is a just act, that is a just act, this is an unjust act, that is an unjust act, but to define what justice really means. What's the truth of it? So he's attempting to go beyond just human law and say there's some principle that defines justice beyond what humans institute. And work, again, is the lot of all humans. Because of our degraded nature, it's necessary for us to survive. But at the same time, there is a goodness in work. And the honest worker, the person who works hard and works right and earns wealth through that manner, will achieve blessings and glory while the, the one who achieves wealth through cheating or violence will ultimately be punished. As we said earlier, he also has a great deal of practical advice in the poem. Most of the poem is taken up by what we might call practical advice. And much of this is about when to plow, when to sow, how to build one's wagons, etc., things like that things related to the farming life, and there's also a section on sailing and the various perils of the sea and when one should set out. Um, but what you'll see when you look at this is that there's a lot of essential details that are lacking. Um, and what it shows us is that he's not teaching anyone how to be a farmer or how to sail, uh, because obviously one must already have a good bit of experience in order to really benefit from anything that Hesiod says. It's more about the best practices once one is a farmer or is a sailor. You already have to know something in order to, to benefit from anything that Hesiod says. So it's limited in its practicality. There's also a great deal of religious advice and uh, taboos and things that we might consider superstitions about certain days of the month, when you should undertake a certain task, when you shouldn't do certain things, what days should be avoided uh, when doing something like farming or getting married, etc., etc. And this is very diverse. Everything from how to choose a wife to where to relieve oneself when you have to go to the bathroom. And it's going to seem very irrational to us, and that's probably because there's a lot of background information that we simply don't know. Um, is this a collection of folk wisdom? Are there perhaps religious precepts or rules that, that were behind the, this advice? We just simply don't know. But it is possible to see some sort of unity here. Um, again, it does. it's never going to make sense to us, frankly, but to understand that there's probably something underneath it that makes sense to its original audience that would have given meaning to some of these, uh, again, fairly strange seeming bits of advice.
So let's break down the narrative going through the lines. And again, this is through the translation that I am using that, uh, from Johns Hopkins Press by Apostolos Athanasicus. Um, so the line numbers may be different in your version. He begins with an invocation to the muses, much shorter than that in Theogony, but still the traditional invocation. Muses, please let me speak of these words. Give me the wisdom to speak of uh, human life and the proper way to live and the laws of Zeus. And then lines 10 to 34, he talks about the two different kinds of strife. He says there are two kinds of strife in the universe. One is bad because it causes conflict, violence, war. But the other strife is what we might call struggle or opposition or just the everyday uh, problems that we have to deal with, the reality of life that encourages us to work, that causes us to try to better our lives and to survive. So he differentiates between these two kinds of strife. And then he gives his first admonition to Perses about his cheating ways and tells the story of what Perses tried to do, how he attempted to take more than his fair share of the inheritance. Lines 47 to 109 repeats in, in a bit more detail the story of Zeus and Prometheus uh, from Theogony. He talks about different aspect of it. Here in the works and days, the focus is on Pandora, the first woman, who is sent as punishment uh, for humanity because Prometheus stole fire and gave it to humans. And there's a, there's a great description of just how beautiful Pandora is and all these great um, attributes that she has, as well as, of course, her negative aspects and all the suffering that she brings into the world by opening Pandora's jar, or depending on the translation, Pandora's box, a very famous story that you've probably heard. Then he goes into the ages of man from lines 110 to 202. And this is where he talks about the, the general theme of decline and suffering and the sins and punishment of the gods of the various ages because of what they've done. Let's look a, a bit more closely at those different ages. So first, there's the golden age. And these humans, these beings, lived a carefree life without pain or suffering. And these were all men, we should note. Pandora doesn't come about until later in the, uh, the ages, although it's not entirely clear where she fits in. But in the Golden Age, it seems, it was all men, and they lived a carefree life of peace and abundance. But for some reason, they all died. The earth covered this race, uh, a phrase that you'll see repeated throughout the poem. Why? Hesiod never tells us. After this, we get the Silver Age, uh, the second uh, generation of men. And they also lived carefree lives, but he, they're described specifically as children, as very childlike, almost as spoiled brats. And he says they were very reckless and violent and they refused to honor the gods. And for this, they were punished and all killed off. Yet, they're still honored. They still have a place of honor above modern humans. Then we get to the Bronze Age, and these are uh, humans of great strength and violence as well. They are dreadful and mighty, he says, and their weapons and tools were all made of bronze. Um, and he describes them as being consumed by violence and warfare. And uh, perhaps even there's a sense that they destroyed themselves because, again, their age is covered by the earth. And they're followed by the heroic age that's very similar in, in many ways, but they're described as better and more just than their bronze predecessors. So these are the great heroes of Greek legend, the heroes of the Iliad and the Trojan War and the Odyssey. So Achilles, Hercules, Perseus, Theseus, all of those figures, Odysseus. Um, and they battled and they were, they were men of war as well, but some also lived peacefully. But ultimately, Hesiod says, they too were destroyed by war and their age was covered up. Finally, we get to the Iron Age, the modern world. And Hesiod says that he wishes he were not a member of this Iron Age. And what defines the Iron Age again is suffering and toil, that we have to work and that we are worn down by our labor. He also explicitly describes how they have declined or we have declined in our morals and ethics. Neighbors don't help each other. People don't honor the gods. The kings take advantage of their subjects. Subjects defy their kings. Children defy their parents, etc., etc. So this is a, an age of decline, an age of loose morality. And he says that this age, too, will eventually be destroyed. And some, 
might be taken up to Olympus to live as gods, but the rest will suffer and die. So that's our lot, the modern world, in Hesiod's perspective. Then we get into the moral and ethical section of the poem. He begins with a fable of the hawk and nightingale, and this is a fable about justice, and he addresses it to kings to warn them not to be unjust, and of course, to his brother Perses. And then he gives us a long section on justice, where he attempts to tell us what justice is, and he describes it as divine, as the daughter of Zeus. So he's raising it, again, above the level of mere human law to a divine principle, something that underlies the universe itself. And he talks about all the crimes against injustice, what happens, what are the things that people do uh, to defy justice or to pervert it. And he gives examples of just versus unjust acts and talks about how ultimately behaving in a just manner, following the divine uh, daughter of Zeus, justice, one will achieve benefits and blessings, but injustice will lead to punishment. After justice, he moves into his second cardinal virtue, and that is work. And again, because of our lot, because of our place in the ages of man, work is the lot of all humans. It's what we have to do in order to survive. But it is moral. There is a goodness to labor. There is something good about it. And it's closely related to justice, because the person who earns their wealth through hard labor is behaving in a just manner, whereas unearned or stolen wealth is uh, achieved through injustice and, again, ultimately will be punished. Um, and he talks about some virtues related to uh, work, so such as neighborliness, being a good neighbor, paying your workers when, what they're owed, being generous with those who need it, being hospitable to those who are in need. So there's a close connection between work, labor, and morality. Now, the first uh, 400 lines of the poem or so are the most interesting because that's where he talks about the ages of man and the virtues. Then the major section of the poem is the less interesting and, and more confusing part. And this is where he gets into his practical advice. So he gives a long section on the advice for the laborer and farmer. And again, it's a mix of practical and moral advice. And again, also not very useful if you don't already know something about farming. And much of the focus is on the proper times to engage in various actions. And then he gives us a short uh, excursus on sailing, and which he admits he doesn't really know a lot about sailing, but he learned his knowledge from the muses. And again, the focus is on when should you do something? What's the proper time to engage in a certain act? When should you sail out? When shouldn't you sail out? Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. And the last 200 lines or so uh, is the mix of moral and religious advice. We have a, a huge array of topics here. He talks about marriage, how to pick a wife. He talks about maintaining your relationships with others, how to pick good friends, who you should avoid, how to maintain friendships, how you should treat your friendships. Um, some very graphic descriptions of bodily functions, cleanliness, and propriety, uh, which again is probably going to seem very strange and maybe a little disgusting to us, but uh, the sense is that this this is about not so much about where you should go to the bathroom, but about showing proper respect for the gods and how to maintain your, your cleanliness in order to honor the gods, as well as probably to um, uh, maintain your good relationships with your neighbors. So don't, for example, go pee in a river because uh, that's bad, that's going to pollute it, and it shows disrespect to nature and the, the goddess of that river. And there's also a lot of description of ritual practices, sacrifices, feasts, what you should do to properly honor the gods. So it's moral, it's religious. Um, again, it might seem a little strange to us, but there is, it seems, some sort of underlying reason for it, even if it's a reason and a rationality, a logic that we can't quite apprehend from our modern perspective. And this finally gets into the last section of the poem where um, he, he focuses even more particularly on these things that are seem like religious taboos, or perhaps even superstitions. He talks about different days of the month when you should or shouldn't do a certain act, what days are, are lucky, what days are unlucky or prohibited. Um, and much of this is going to seem, again, nonsensical or abstract or totally random to us, uh, but that's because we just don't know where it's coming from. We don't know where Hesiod got these ideas or what the reason for them was. 
and whether or not he himself even believed in these things. Perhaps it's a mix of folk superstitions. Perhaps they are religious precepts that underlie this. Perhaps he's just collecting sort of wisdom that's been passed down, a bit like a farmer's almanac. Um, but again, it's very strange. You're not necessarily going to understand it, but it's useful just to read it and say, hmm, well, just to get an exposure to a very different way of understanding time and the, the way humans relate to time. So let's ask some questions about works and days. First, what is it that makes the prior generations, the gold, silver, bronze, and heroic generations, better than the modern age? Is it their behavior? Is it their ex existence? Is it their experience? And what do we learn from their faults that uh, might help us, in Hesiod's mind, be better, be more moral? Um, and really, we might ask, is there anything better about them? Or is Hesiod just saying, well, the, they were better than us? Is there a reason for it? And then looking at the values that Hesiod espouses, what does justice mean to him? What are the defining characteristics of just versus unjust acts? Um, so not just the specific examples that he gives, but what's the principle behind it? Can you get a sense of what it means to be just to Hesiod? And how might this compare to our modern sense of justice? And then why is work such an important value? Why does he want to promote work as important, as uh, something that we should all do and engage in happily, even if it is something that also is part of our suffering? Now thinking about both of Hesiod's works in, in uh, conjunction, what similarities do you see between Theogony and the works and days? And that can include stylistic similarities, thematic similarities, similarities in the types of values that he espouses. Um, how do these poems complement each other? And also, are there contrasts? Are there contradictions? Are there aspects of works and days that seem to contrast or uh, differ from what he says in Theogony and vice versa? So thinking about how these poems work together as uh, bodies of work from the same poet. And why is he so focused in the works and days on the proper time to do things? What does that say about what Hesiod's values are or how he understands humans' place in the grand scheme of things? And how does it relate to the values or the story of the Theogony? And then finally, how does the theme of decline affect Hesiod's style, his narrative, his meaning in both poems? What does it reveal about how he understands the universe to work and, and what human life is all about? And what might that reflect about his culture as a whole? What they thought their place in the universe was, how they thought their relationship to the wider world around them was structured and what it meant to be alive and meant to be a human. So let's review just a few things. Um, again, he sees its major themes, and there are more, but these are just the ones that I've picked out. The idea of order and the idea of decline and the values of justice and work. How do these combine and mix and interact in these two poems? Also, something I haven't talked about much, but I encourage you to think about Hesiod's misogyny that he, in both poems, talks about women as punishment for humanity. Um, and we can think specifically, in what ways does he say that women punish are a punishment or cause problems for humans? But why? Why is he so misogynistic? Is it just a matter of, well, that's the way things were back then? Or is there some principle underlying it? Or is he trying to enforce some social structure? Uh, again, important to remember that Hesiod is a compiler, not a creator. He is collecting and unifying a vast body of already existing beliefs and tales and trying to put them into a coherent form. So how does, that, um, how does he try to make these different things cohere? And where does he succeed? Where does he fail? And finally, as I've said and asked a number of times, thinking about Hesiod as a reflection of Greek culture. What does he reveal about Greek history, about their beliefs? how the Greeks understood their world and their place in it, and what sort of contradictions might have existed in Greek thought. What are the problems that Greeks, just as any, any uh, philosophy has to deal with, any culture has to deal with, what are the contradictions in their understandings of the universe around them?
So that's the end of the lecture on Hesiod and his works. Uh, remember to complete your reading journal for this week. Uh, next, after you've watched the, the videos and read the works, complete quiz one on Blackboard. And of course, the first essay is due also on Monday the 17th. So um, if you have any questions about anything in this essay or, any, or in this, this lecture or any of the uh, readings that you've done, anything else related to the course, of course, you can email me, you can call or text, uh, or you can post on Blackboard. Uh, so that's it. Again, please feel to contact me if you have any questions and have a great rest of your week.